So we're lucky to have Eric Lifkowski, um here with us today. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur um, and, a, and an investor, uh, a tech investor. He's, he's basically you know, done a half dozen or so companies. Um, I tried to count. I think it's around six or maybe seven. That's right. Um, a couple of, uh, a, a trio of public ones, uh, Inner Workings, Echo Global Logistics. Um, in 2007, and, and this will start to sound familiar if you already don't know who he is, Eric put a million bucks into a kind of a, sort of a very idealistic activist website called thepoint.com, which eventually became Groupon, which then turned into like the fastest growing startup ever, I think, by some, yeah. by some counts. Um, he's now um, running a company called Tempest, which is a, it's like a health data company. It's super ambitious. They're growing really fast. Um, so let's just get into to Tempest quickly. I mean, you know, you had done a bunch of stuff, you know, business services companies, media companies, uh, you know, Groupon. Uh, you know, what caused you to sort of want to get into the healthcare space, want to yeah. do what you're doing now? I mean, <clears throat> so I've spent my you know entire career basically structuring unstructured, messy data. If you look at the common thing of all those companies, it's it's that. And whether it's um, manufacturing or logistics or printing, we're trying to bring technology to industries that have not had a lot of technology. I never thought I would get into healthcare, but about four years ago, when I was dealing with somebody who was doing you know, fighting cancer, I was just perplexed at how little uh, data had permeated uh, that process. And I became convinced that we had to bring the same kind of technology to healthcare that we were bringing to other industries. And so about three years ago, we started Tempest trying to figure out if we could just fix the underlying data infrastructure in cancer care and then <clears throat> eventually all healthcare. And, and the, the, the challenge in fixing the underlying data infrastructure was really about getting the, the kind of data you would need, which is clean, structured, clinical data connected to molecular data in one place. So it's all about figuring out you know, who are these patients, what drugs are they taking, how are they responding to those drugs, and then by sequencing those patients, which we do at Tempest, you can begin to understand why, why they're having that response. So it was really the personal experience of, of, of seeing this firsthand and dealing with it that made me say, um, you know, I want to spend my life focused on it. Got it. So, and, and just so everyone, uh, if, if, for people who aren't experts, including myself, <clears throat> I mean, when you say sequencing, this is different, I guess, from 23andMe or Ancestry.com. I mean, you know, we, we've seen on the con kind of consumer side these um, kind of consumer ge genetic tests become very popular or kind of popular. I mean, how, wh what are the, the, the sequencing that you're talking about? It's much more sophisticated. Yeah, so we, we operate, I think, I think by sample count, we're, we're, we might be the second largest, probably the second largest clinical sequencer of cancer patients in the U.S. <clears throat> and, and, you know, um, growing, going quite rapidly. The kind of sequencing we do is, is uh, governed by what's called CLIA-CAP, which is a, uh, it's a laboratory act that basically governs companies like ours who do clinical sequencing that patients would get when they're being treated, which is r very different than the kind of sequencing that, that other folks might do, um, what's often referred to as Mendelian sequencing or, or you know, it's kind of germline sequencing that you would get from people who kind of run those tests where it's often about looking at characteristics more on the prevention side, we're on the managing disease side. And as a result, because these are patients who are sick, who are being treated, and who are likely going to get, in our case, targeted oncotherapies, which could be chemotherapies, radiotherapies, or targeted drugs, which are, by their very nature, toxic and have adverse um, events associated with them, the sequencing we do has to be um, in great depth. So I often tell people who don't understand sequencing, think of it like a, a magnifying glass. You know, we're sequencing what's, um, our average depth of coverage could be, you know, 500 to 1,000 X depending on the panels we run. And often the kind of sequencing that some of these other folks do is 25 X or 30 X or 50 X or 75 X. And so it's a much lower depth of coverage. Right. And so, so this, I mean, very quickly, I imagine, becomes a data problem. And, you know, uh, we were talking, I think, just before, and this, the kind of sequencing we're talking about, you know, used to cost in the millions of dollars. Now it costs, what, in, in the thousands of dollars? Um, and that's by virtue of, you know, what, Moore's Law and cloud computing and, you know, yeah, the... It, it's actually, I mean, what's interesting in, in, in the case of, of cancer care and I think healthcare more broadly is you actually have multiple massive technology paradigm shifts hitting at one time. So not only can we store data at costs that are unimaginable, 
and we have all these tools like you know machine learning tools such as natural language processing and optical character recognition which are pretty amazing but you also have a, a genomic revolution that is really unparalleled so it's something like a million fold reduction in the cost of generating this data over the past 12 years or so and if you look at and there's all these kind of famous graphs looking at the co the, the cost of generating molecular data and it's actually been decreasing at about two times the pace of Moore's law. So that's so so obviously so servers are getting cheaper. But what's the other part of that? What, like what else is driving the the cost? Well, it's a series of. I mean, there's a series of companies, Illumina being the most well known, yeah. um, who have developed technologies over the past you know decade that um, no different than Intel did this with processors that have allowed this data to be generated at super low cost Got compared to, to to in the past, and so. We now, for the first time ever, have the ability at a sustainably low cost to collect and structure clinical data yeah. and combine that with molecular data and then use machine learning and basic artificial intelligence to try to figure out what, what patterns exist so actually we can help um, clinicians, in our case oncologists most often, make real-time data-driven decisions by figuring out of all the different drugs that they might think about for a patient which is likely to have the best response. So uh, today, I, I think, or, or maybe late yesterday, the, the Wall Street Journal reported, um, you know, that Amazon, which, you know, uh, is, is sort of scary to, to all sorts of people in all, all sorts of industries, is is coming for you to some extent anyway. They're, they they announced a, a, that they're going to um, <coughs> sell software that's going to mine um, patient medical records. Um, you know, of course, a lot of uh, Apple, Google, they've all, they're all kind of, you know, playing in this space a little bit. I'm kind of curious sort of what you make of the Amazon announcement, but maybe maybe more broadly, you know, big tech in general uh, getting into this world. Yeah, I think with Amazon, it's really, you know, I mean, far too early to tell. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think is the, the larger theme, I think, is quite positive, which is um, there's only a few large sectors of the US economy that haven't been completely upended by technology. M maybe the government being one, healthcare being a another. And so I think, um, the fact that you know companies like Google and uh, Microsoft and Amazon and Apple have all announced initiatives in this space is really positive, and I think um, it's likely to be the start of a, of a very prolonged trend. Uh, because again, if you think about these underlying technology currents, the ability to collect and structure data at historically low cost, to analyze that data with all kinds of imaging technologies to generate molecular data, what this means is that. Um, we should be able to use technology to keep people alive and have them live better lives. And given the size of the healthcare market, three plus trillion, this is a, a, a huge space that I think all of these big technology companies are going to want to find a way uh, in. Sure. On. So, you know, we've heard versions of this in the past. I mean, you know, Watson, IBM has kind of been telling, I, I would say, kind of a related story. I, I don't know if you think that's a fair comparison about. You know, using artificial intelligence and, and their their natural language processing to you know help doctors make sense of unstructured data. It feels like a lot of these things you know haven't gone that far, or, or maybe haven't gone as far as um, kind of the marketing promises have 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 suggested. And I'm kind of curious what you make of that. I mean, I think it's completely fair. I mean, I, I think we we when we started Tempest, we wanted to take a holistic approach to this problem because yeah. we felt like. Every single approach, every siloed approach, even though they're quite good, was only solving part of the problem. And so at the end of the day, we talk a lot in our world about combining clinical and molecular data. We're really combining three kinds of data, uh, phenotypic data, morphologic data, and molecular data, so text, images, and molecules. And it's only when you combine all three of these that you really can get a picture of, as to what's happening to this patient. There's great imaging companies that look at anatomic pathology slides and radiology scans and do cool work, but they're often missing the context of what happened to the patient that's locked inside physician notes or pathology reports. And likewise, there's great companies who sequence or great companies that structure data. If you want to solve the problem, we think you have to do it all. You have to have it all under one roof so you actually can see what's happening to these patients and begin to look at the patterns that might describe why. And so I think we hear all the time that some of these historic efforts didn't work. And I, I, don't, I don't think it means a whole lot other than um, often early stage siloed efforts in the midst of technology paradigm shifts don't produce what you ultimately will see through time. A great example would be early search engines like Lycos and AltaVista didn't have the same impact on our life that Google had. 
And so I think um, the question for us is, do the underlying technologies exist that would allow a company like Tempest to gain scale? And the answer is yes. And the, I guess the evidence of that would be, I think we now have something like 250 hospital systems working with Tempest, including about 75% of all NCI cancer centers, and roughly 25% of all cancer patients in the US come through Tempest. Right. And so this kind of scale w was unimaginable, I think, a few years ago until these, these historic uh, uh, trends were in place. I, I want to talk about the kind of implications. But before I get there, um, you know, you started this company, you know, after whatever, a bunch of interesting experiences. You know, obviously Groupon, you, you, you definitely came into contact with Amazon, uh, you know, while, while, which, was a, which bought a competitor. I'm kind of curious, like, are there lessons from the Groupon experience that, that you actually, that have been useful in this business? Or is it just, like, so wildly different that, like, it's like one chapter of your life closes, another one opens? Or, or I think what do you take away from that? I that crazy we, experience. I mean, I, well, I think that, you know, we've been, I've been fortunate uh, that, you know, I've been part of starting six companies. Yeah. And they all have um, had really interesting past. And so you learn something from each one. Three went public. We, 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 we sold one called Media Ocean. And so um, those were all, and two we operate today. One is a company called Uptake that my partner Brad Keywell operates, and I, um, and I um, run Tempest. But you, know, you, you take something away from, from each of these, and you kind of build on it. And I always right. say to people, I, you know, it's pretty simple. In each experience, I try to repeat whatever worked well and avoid whatever didn't. And um, there's not much more to it than, than that. And so at Groupon, we did a bunch of things amazingly well, which led the company to grow from, I think, 30 million in sales our first year to 4 billion in sales our third year, yeah. which, which was kind of crazy in terms of growth. But there's a lot of things we didn't do well that, you, that I wouldn't repeat. And I think- What's, um, the, what's the most important thing in your mind that, that didn't go well that you wouldn't repeat? Well, I think for a lot of companies, uh, at, during, you know, we were the end of an era where companies went public very soon. Yeah. Um, first of all, the rules changed. The SEC actually changed its basic guidelines of how many shareholders you could have to, to allow for companies to stay private longer. And I think what you've seen in this recent crop of big technology companies like Airbnb and Uber and the like is a willingness to stay private much longer and ensure that their business model is really fully developed before they enter the public domain. And I actually think it's a much healthier uh, pattern for people. Um, some of these businesses that are really high growth, there's just natural volatility that comes with that. So, when, and when, especially when you think about a company like Tempest, to, and we're not just in cancer today, we also have expanded into diabetes and depression, and next year we'll move into other diseases like cardiovascular disease. So you're talking about these huge industries, you know, huge technology paradigm shifts, and so you really wanna make sure uh, in terms of your model, that things are in place before you think about uh, the public. So, okay, so you, you said Tempest is doing 25% of cancer patients sequencing. No, no, 25% of patients come through Tempest. Okay, so and, and we what sequence some smaller percentage. So, what percentage of cancer patients are getting sequenced today? Roughly? So, so we 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 touch we touch cancer patient data, some clinical, some molecular, for about a quarter of the country, Got which it. also happens to be roughly the percent of cancer patients that get sequenced throughout the entire country. So, and, and is this the kind of thing, I mean, how long before everybody who gets a cancer diagnosis is going to get a genetic, you know, uh, get sequenced? You know, I, I mean, I would think, and again, it's, it's speculation, but I would, uh, today about 25% of cancer patients will get sequenced. Um, there's 1.7 million people diagnosed with cancer a year, about 25% will get sequenced. I would think in about five years, that's 100% of patients. Okay. And I would think anybody who has metastatic disease or late stage disease or high risk disease will be sequenced multiple times, both their solid tumor and through what's called cell-free DNA analysis or, or do some kind of liquid biopsy. <laughs> So, um, and I think that same thing, that's, that same pattern will start to emerge in, uh, for sure, neurological disorders, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, immunology, and the like, because we're starting to see pharmacogenomic and other patterns where sequencing patients can produce really interesting data to, think, to, to tell doctors that one class of drugs will work better than another. So, you know, I, I think I would assume in five or 10 years, we're all being sequenced a lot. Got um, it. So that's a huge opportunity. I mean, that's like, you know, you know, potentially thousands of dollars. I mean, I, I guess the prices will probably come down, so, so maybe it doesn't, not quite as good as it sounds, but um, what does that do to the overall cost of healthcare? I mean, is, it gonna make, is this gonna make healthcare cheaper, or is this gonna be like another kind of expensive thing that, you know, is good for patient outcomes, but, but is also, you know, causing, you know, 
patients, insurance companies, the whole system to, to, to be further strained? Yeah, I think so. The purely the sequencing side of this, I think I, some, and I, I'm not a, I can't I'm forecast industries, but yeah, I think there's a, f a few people that do, and typically it, worldwide, it's, it looks like about a hundred billion in 2025. So it's a seriously large space. Yeah. But I would think um, the, the the global healthcare market obviously is you know, um, you know, 30, 30 times that in the United States alone, and so I would assume what will happen is. Uh, all of these data efforts that cost money, whether you're generating clinical data or molecular data, will be sizable. But I would think uh, there's probably something like a two for one, or three for one, or five for one, or ten for one reduction in the total cost of healthcare uh, relative to the collection of this data. In large yeah. part because the, the whole point of collecting the data is to navigate people to the right therapeutic. And so much of our healthcare, so many of our healthcare dollars go toward the last 90 days of care and go toward people being hospitalized when the care goes wrong. And in cancer patients in particular, where you have a relatively short duration of life, if you have late stage or high risk disease, you can't afford to have things go wrong. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on a you know, kind of massive reduction in the cost of total health care and the material prolonging of life by virtue of collecting this data. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, we, have, we don't, I mean, that's what we're going to see, right? Right. You know, this, this space is really interesting just because there's so many ethical issues, you know, and, and uh, uh, we, we did a story, Business Week did a story about um, this, these murder cases, these kind of amateur and, and professional detectives using um, public genetic data. Are there, are there ethical issues here if we're all getting sequenced, you know, multiple times in our lives or once a year or like, you know, like, do, do we have to be thinking, all of us have to be thinking about you know, where does this data get stored and who's going to have custody over it and, like, those kind of difficult um, ethical issues? Yeah, I think this is actually one of the few areas where um, from its onset, or at least over the last 10 years from its onset, the, 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 the laws and the federal government have actually done a, gr a, a good job at thinking about this data. There are all kinds of laws, HIPAA and, and the like, that govern um, uh, health information data and, and how it can be used and what makes data identifiable and not identifiable and what rules exist. Um, patients are appropriately consented. They are made aware of what happens with this data in ways that don't exist on the Internet today. So a lot of the things you hear about with data, people using that data to target ads or to do other things, <laughs> Um, just don't exist in in our world. So you're not going to sell my genetic information to Facebook, is well, what yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure if they'd even do with it. But um, at the end of the day, the the reality is we're um, completely uh, uh, managed and governed by a series of regulations that I think have have largely helped patients. It's now those laws have a fine balance because. On the one hand, you want to protect patients' information. On the other hand, you want to make sure that that data is in the, in the hands of researchers broadly enough right. that cures can be found. What we find, which is super interesting, is in cancer, patients who, who are asked to consent to sharing their data, it's something like 99% of patients uh, agree to have their data broadly shared, identifiable yeah. or not identifiable. Now, we don't share identifiable, only, only de-identified data. But if you're sick and you have a disease, you're less focused on what's going to happen with my data, and you're far more focused on can somebody help find a cure that's actually going to make me better. Yeah.